Hi, and welcome to Live from the Lab. This is the show where we go over different technologies uh, that Brooker develops in order to help researchers understand the world around us. My name is John Genke, and today I'm joined by Nate Henderson. Hey, guys. And our topic is X-ray sources, particularly those for X-ray diffraction. So, Nate, X-ray sources come in all different flavors. Yeah. Don't they? Yeah. Um, I mean, you can talk about uh, an X-ray source from, say, like one of the the handheld guns that you would use for, like, say, scrap metal identification, um, all the way up to, you know, the the really big beam lines that you see at, say, synchrotrons or national laboratories. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So for X-ray diffraction, though, um, you know, we can't all have a beam line in the lab, I suppose. <laughs> a lot of people don't quite have the the space or the power requirements or, I guess, the funding sources for something like that. Yeah. Yeah. So our design, um, you know, beam lines are using wiggling electrons and such, mm -hmm. but in the lab, we're, our our technology really goes back. 100 years, so the yeah, beginning just, of Yeah, just over 100 right? years, yeah. So the uh, the old school Rankin tubes, yeah. Yeah, so Rankin, he's the guy. Everybody's probably seen the postage stamp with the uh, the skeleton hand and the little fi uh, ring on the finger. Oh, yeah, his wife's hand, yeah. Yep. So, uh, I mean, that's, that's part of the reason why they call it an x-ray is because, you know, people didn't know what it was. It was sort of this, like, mysterious, can't-see-it thing that, um, you know, if you happen to hold, you know, your arm up in front of, uh, you can see your skeleton. And, you know, historically, uh, that... I think most people tend to freak out if, if you were to say, I know what your skeleton looks like. Um, yeah, especially, I mean, if you've only seen it, like you've seen chicken bones or something, then right, all of a sudden you're like, right. oh, I can see mine. What's going on here? Yeah, right? so it was supposed to be like a harbinger of doom back in the day. So um, Rankin's wife actually like did it go back to his lab after he took that one perfect image by it. So, but things, but the classic tubes are actually pretty much... Similar, right? Yeah, I mean, I mean the, the fundamental technology hasn't changed dramatically since then. Um, you have a tungsten filament uh, inside of it. Um, I've actually got one right here. Um, you've got a tungsten filament uh, in the bottom of this. So this is going to, um, you're going to apply um, some current to it. You're going to boil off some electrons. We've got a video, I think, that we're going to show here yep. in, in a little bit yep. to kind of explain this. Um, but then these will get accelerated up, and they'll hit your little copper target. So this one is stamped with copper. So I know that this is a copper x-ray tube. This is going to generate copper x-rays uh, because there's a copper target in there. Um, and once this bombards out, then one of these two little windows will come out. So this is kind of a neat tube. We'll talk mm -hmm. about it here in a little bit, I think. But um, So x-rays are pretty high energy. Pretty high energy, yeah. And uh, in fact, they're sometimes called an ionizing radiation. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So that's kind of scary. I mean, that... Like at the doctor, for example, you know, the technician always leaves the lab. <laughs> Goes behind the big wall. big, heavy lead vest on you sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. Are these things really safe oh, in yeah. an x-ray diffraction experiment? Um, I mean, I, I wouldn't be, like, holding one right now if it was, uh, mm -hmm. you know, any sort of danger. Um, but, yeah, so we're actually working with much lower energies than you would see at, say, um, the dentist's office or the doctor's office. Um, you know, one of the things that they want to do there is they want to make sure that they can actually punch through, you know, everything, yeah. um, which is why you go behind a wall. But the reason why you go behind a wall is because you can attenuate x-rays through things like distance, through things like thickness of um, material. So you'll notice that, like, on all of our systems, if you've ever seen, like, one of the bench tops, like, it's, it's pretty beefy, mm -hmm. you know, little compact instrument. And a lot of this has to deal with the building that you need. You need to have a certain amount of metal. Um, all of the glass that's in... Um, our doors is going to have something to attenuate it, um, so like leaded glass or something like that, to to make sure that um, the X-rays can't escape. Um, so that even if you're standing right next to the enclosure, like there's no there's no radiation coming out. Yeah, it's I mean safety is always something I think that that pops up, uh, and whenever we talk about talk to customers about instruments and about X-ray in general is yeah, uh, you know number one, do you have any X-rays coming out of the machine? Yeah. I, I can say this with with most X-ray systems. Of course, you have to check manufacturer by manufacturer, but there's pretty high standards yeah. uh, for this. Yeah. And I the mean, other question I, I sometimes get, I mean, and to some of like to some people who are in the know, it, it seems like a funny question. But after you've exposed the sample, mm -hmm. you know, oh yeah, is it yeah, still radioactive? Yeah. Like, is that still potentially harmful to you? Yeah, I get that question sometimes where people say, like, well, how long do I need to leave the door shut before the uh, the sample isn't radioactive, right? I mean, it's like, um, you know, it's like, how long do you need to wait before you open the microwave door? Yeah, yeah. yeah, like, yeah. As, soon as, you're, as soon as you either put the shutter in the way, and we'll, we'll point out the shutters on the instruments when we go down to the lab in a little bit, um, or if you kill power to the x-ray tube, you stop generating x-rays, right? It's like turning off a light bulb. You know, it's like, I don't need to wait three minutes to go into a room after I turn off a live right, bulb. Right, right, yeah. It's, yeah, it just, 
Yeah, sometimes I think the term is a passive versus an active radiator. Right. So yeah. uranium, you had a pile of uranium here, that's a passive radiator. It's going right. to yeah. give off radiation. On the other hand, these tubes yeah. and the x-rays we use, those are active. You've They're created only... radiation, it is not right. radioactive. That's right. Yeah, yeah. So to go a little bit more into depth on how the, that x-ray source works and some of our other sources, uh, we're going to head over to a video right now. How are x-rays generated? Classic x-ray sources consist of a tungsten filament and a metallic anode suspended in a vacuum tube. When electrons run through the filament, electrons are boiled off. The electrons are accelerated toward the anode with a strong electric field. When the electrons interact with the atoms in the anode, two different things can occur. The first possibility is that the electron will be redirected by the positive charge of the nucleus, producing a broad emission spectrum known as bremsstrahlung. The second possibility is that an electron is knocked out of the atom. The hole is filled by a higher energy electron, resulting in the emission of an X-ray with a very specific energy. These are called characteristic X-rays. In addition to creating X-rays, a large amount of energy is converted into heat, requiring the anode to be cooled. In the traditional tube, the large footprint of the wide electron beam limits the heat dissipation, requiring the anode to be water-cooled. By using a small, spot-shaped electron beam, heat can be dissipated in three dimensions. These micro-focus sources allow the anode to be air-cooled and produce a very bright spot beam. If maximum signal is required, a rotating anode source is the best choice. The anode is spun at several thousand RPM in a vacuum chamber, evenly distributing the heat across the entire surface. Because of this, it can be operated at a much higher power level. Producing x-rays is just one part of a comprehensive solution. Efficient optics, precisely controlled sample handling, and sensitive detectors are all important in achieving the best result. So uh, we saw a bunch of different types of x-ray sources there, ranging from yeah. sealed tubes, microfocuses, and rotating anodes. Mm -hmm. So it seems like the rotating anode is, is the, the big powerhouse. Yeah. Why not just use it all the time? Oh, are you, are you a, a more power kind of guy? Yeah, why not? Yeah. Why Do you not? remember that show growing up? Oh, it was uh, Tim the Toolman Taylor. Home Improvement. Home yeah. Improvement. Yeah. It was like, yeah. more power. More power. More why not? Power. Why not more power? Well, OK, so I mean, I'm not a. I'm not a more. I'm I'm little. I'm not, <laughs> I'm not a. I'm not a more power kind of guy, right? Okay. Um, and I think that there's the easiest way for me to always think about X-ray tubes is like we mentioned earlier. Is you know it's just I mean it's it's high energy invisible light, mm -hmm. right? And I always think about it in terms of things like, like light bulbs. Like I just replaced all of the light bulbs down in the basement, um, and I went to uh, Menards, love Menards, right? And there's so it's like an overwhelming number of light bulbs to choose from um and not just in terms of like shape but in terms of like brightness in terms of efficiency in terms of like you know is it cfl is it led is it incandescent um and the easiest way for me to think about like a, a rotating anode is it's like a it's like a floodlight or okay. like a like a big yeah. spotlight yeah. right and there are times when you need to have this kind of light um you know we talked about the dentist or the, yep, you know, uh, yep. the doctor's office. And you know, they have those really, really bright lights that they shine on your face whenever you're at the dentist yep, and yep. they have to give you the little glasses. That's because they need to see, is there something on your teeth, right? Um, this would be the equivalent of say like a rotating anode. You need a ton of intensity, but that intensity isn't always something that you, you, you want. Um, say you were trying to um, light up, a, you know, uh, say your, your dinner plate for like an Instagram yep, shot yep. or something like that. You wouldn't necessarily need a floodlight. You would need something that's, you know, smaller, more appropriate for the size of what you're trying to illuminate. Um, you know, right like, tool, right job. Right tool, right job. Right. It's like, what are you trying to to look at? Because if you've got, you know, if you think about like a, a huge light bulb, like a lighthouse, yep. And you were trying to use that lighthouse to to light up, you know, uh, a word on a sheet of paper, you'd be throwing away a lot of that intensity. Yeah. Yeah. And I think. Yeah, I mean, here on Live from the Lab, we, li we like to keep it real. Uh, so <laughs> maintenance. Maintenance, Ma maintenance yeah. comes into this too, right? Maintenance and is part of it. High you know? power. High You're power. You're going to have to change a few parts. High wear. But I think that that's one of the things that um, 
Bruker's rotating anode. So there are, of course, applications where you need to have that intensity when you're looking for very small amounts of material or very low loadings of, um, of say, you know, like one particular phase. Um, but one of the things that uh, our engineering team has done is they've really focused on making sure that that maintenance, which you know is going to be there, um, is, is easy to do. So the, the, um, the filaments are easily replaceable. They're little brushes that make your you know, electrical connections. Um, you don't have to draw back, and you can just sort of pop them in yep. and out. So yep. your, your uptime ends up being higher. But with a rotating anode system, you are, you are going to have some, some amount of maintenance. You know, it's, it's just to be expected. Yeah, you drive a car, you got to change the oil. Yeah. You drive a race car, you got to change that oil a little bit more frequently. <laughs> yeah. Right? So. so to see some of the, uh, these actual sources, though, uh, in action, to see what they actually look like, we're going to head on over to the lab. Yep. See you in a few. Uh, in the lab, so we're with our D8 Discover. That's the little bit bigger box. And uh, what kind of source is on this one, Nate? Okay, so this one is going to be the traditional Rankin tube, the traditional seal tube. Um, so you can see that down below we have all of our high voltage cables. You'll also see um, some water cables that we talked about cooling. Okay. Right. So this is going to generate a lot of heat. Yep. Um, and actually, if I put my hands next to it, you know, you feel a little bit of warmth right there. Yeah, um, I think back in school we did the calculation, and if you turn the cooling water off, we're dumping so much power it'll melt the copper in something <laughs> like 40 seconds. Yeah. So you need to you need to have cooling water, and obviously in the safety circuits, there's yep. there's a restriction of the cooling water must be going. So speak in a safety, I mean, here it says x-rays on. Do I need to be, should I be concerned that the doors are open, um, x-rays are on? So they're shielding in through the enclosure here. Okay. Um, you notice I have my hand right up against it, no problems. There's also a shutter right here that is uh, locked into the safety system, Yep. The safety interlock. So it's it's basically like a door for x-rays, right? Okay. So if this door is shut, nothing can get out. And so you can manipulate yep. your samples, you can wave your hands around. No okay. issues. Yeah, and Brooker really, I mean, this design has really been tested rigorously for that type of stuff. Right, right. So, you know, our type approvals that we have to um, pass are uh, very, very restrictive in terms of safety. Yep. So, yeah. So then um, after the tube, so we have the tube that's, that's putting out um, really kind of what we call a white beam, right? It has the K alpha 1, the K alpha 2, yeah. K beta, but it also has like white radiation, right? Yeah, you can think about it like white white light or like white x-ray, yep. so sort of a broad. Um, so that's what this optic um, has the ability to do. So this optic here has uh, three different components. Um, you know, we talk about not just the sources, but sort of the whole instrument itself. So you'll notice three stickers here. The first one is going to be a diversion beam. So this would be used for traditional fragment tonneau, um, powder diffraction type applications. This will give you um, some of the brimster long. This will give you copper K alpha 1, copper K alpha 2, and copper K beta. Um, and if you wanted to remove the copper K beta, you would either need to couple this with a nickel filter, um, either on the primary or secondary slot, or with a detector like our Linkslight XCT, which can okay. um, remove that. So that'll, the, like a nickel filter, that takes out your K beta, right? Right. What about that white radiation? Um, it, the nickel filter will cut out some of the white radiation as well. Okay. Yes. But also the detectors, right? Those generally have a discriminator good enough to get rid of a lot of that. Um, some of it. Some okay. of it. Um, particularly the XCT, which is you know really an exceptional um, detector. Uh, it's able to get rid of a lot of white radiation, sample fluorescent, yep. so sample-generated X-rays, um, as well as the K-beta. Now, but you can also use optics, right? You can use optics, right. So the other two optics here, um, the first one here is called a global mirror. So the global mirror is... Um, a it's a multi-layer uh, that is going to intercept the beam and it's going to convert it from a diverging beam into a very straight beam. So you see it's going to straight out. This will also get rid of um, K beta. Okay. So the beam that comes out of the global mirror is copper K alpha 1 and 2, and it's very, very straight. Okay. You can combine it with a third optic, so the mirror plus this, what we refer yep. to as a two-bounce monochromator, um, and this will filter the beam even further and make it even straighter. So uh, this one is copper K alpha 1 and 2. This one is copper K alpha 1 only. Okay. Um, and okay. very, very straight. So it would be kind of like you go with powders, you're going to use uh, that diverging beam mm -hmm. for maybe a little bit trickier sample or grazing incidence diffraction. You right. might use the parallel beam. And then if you want to look at thin films, like right. epi stuff, epi then stuff, you might yeah. be going with that calpha mm -hmm. 1, mm -hmm. calpha 2. Okay. So this was the traditional source. Um, 
one other thing I guess to point out is I noticed the head here looks a little looks like it has some sort of mechanism on it. Oh yeah, I completely forgot to talk about that whenever we uh, were over there. So this one is uh, called the twist tube. Um, so there's a little wrench that can go here and it can rotate from um, generating a line of x-rays to generating a point of x-rays. So you can just uh, unlock these screws, twist it, and then lock them back down. Okay. And this will convert you from generating sort of a, you know, a straight line yep. of beams um, to more like a, like a laser pointer. Okay. So we call this line focus versus point focus, or so, spot focus. It, so you would basically just loosen the, a few fastening screws. You'd have to probably disconnect the water and the power? No, you don't. I mean, it's, it's 30 seconds. Oh, really? Yeah, okay. It's so just, you just, you know, loosen the, the fastening screws, turn it, lock it back down. And then the water and everything stays contained. Yeah, the, the okay. tube stays mounted. There's no realignment. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's really designed to be swapped back and forth between the two. Yeah. So really, this source is good for samples that generally are maybe centimeter in size, and uh, yeah. um, I think about things like this for sort of traditional powders where you've yep. got a lot of material, um, where you want to bathe the x-ray. So we talked about the right tool for the right job. If you have a lot of sample and you need more flux, you need to hit more grains of material for things like quantification or materials analysis for, uh, for minerals. Um, Maybe yeah, something, so something big like, like that, this, yeah. right? Yeah. So, um, and, and then also, the, uh, it's easier to change these tubes. It's pretty easy, right? Yeah, a couple of screws, yeah. um, you know, disconnect your water, swap in a new one. I mean, so if you're changing it from copper to moly or chrome, that tends to be pretty exactly, simple. Exactly, exactly. So then on the other side of the lab, mm -hmm. here we have that microfocus source. Right, yeah. So the microfocus is going to be here. So you can see it looks a little bit different. Um, the first thing that you can notice is uh, that this is sort of a, a larger piece. Um, so the, the tube itself is right here. Yep. Um, this bit that's bolted onto it is one of those mirrors that we just talked about that generates a very straight beam. But this one's kind of interesting because there's, a, there's two mirrors. So there's one that's here, and there's one that's 90 degrees mounted to it. So we call this a Montel. So it's two different mirrors. And what this does is this intercepts the beam twice to generate a very straight beam. So this will come out of here as about a two by two, a two by two yeah. spot. Two I, I millimeters like, by two millimeters. I like to think about the microfocus as just, it's all about efficiency, right? And right. so we're generating a very tight electron beam in there. Right. And using that, that mirror, we're actually hitting almost 180 degrees in terms of capture. And that gives us that huge amount of flux going right. out of it, even though it's very low power. Right. Well, and that's one of the reasons, so you'll see there's this fan right here. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So this fan is going to do all the cooling. For really? You. Um, but what's really nice about this particular system is that there's no cooling water. So the, the microfocus tube, so we call this the i s so the mu yep. for microfocus, yep. um, no cooling water, this is just fan. The detector over here on this side, if we think about the instrument being sort of the whole, the sum of the, the parts, right? Um, this is also uh, air-cooled. So this is um, our IGRA detector. It's a very large multi-mode detector, 0D, mm -hmm. 1D, 2D. We've talked about this a few times before in life in the lab. But um, you don't need any, any cooling water for this particular system, which is super convenient for areas where you don't have the infrastructure or you know, you're trying to be a little bit more environmentally conscious um, or you just don't want the hassle of dealing with a chiller. Yeah. They're so, loud. Sometimes when I think, though, about air-cooled things, it tends to mean to me that it's probably not going to last as long or you're going to see the intensity drop really quickly. You no, know, that's actually not the case. So like this um, microfocus tubes, I mean, we're looking you know, five, 10 years of lifetime. Really? So it actually yeah. will keep more intensity longer? Yeah, because you're, if you're not, you're generating a very small spot, right? Yeah. So you're not yeah. cranking the power, um, so you're not going to need, you're, you don't have as much wear and tear, right? Yep. It's like, yeah. um, we think about efficiency. It's like having LED light bulbs in your house. You know, they're not generating a lot of heat. They're not generating a lot of resistance. You're not going to wear through them very fast. Yeah. Simply because they're not pulling as much power. So then um, the beam coming out of here, how big is that? It's, uh, about two by two. Two and by then, two millimeters, okay. Yep, and then you can use these little collimator yeah. things um, to change the size further. So this is a two millimeter collimator. Um, we have a couple of different options size-wise. And what's nice about this is that you can literally just snap it right on. Oh, wow. And they're, so they're magnetically mounted. Yeah. So um, there's three little magnet balls here Okay. Um, that give you really good reproducibility in terms of positioning. And the nice thing about it being magnetically mounted is I don't have to go look for that wrench that's always missing. Yeah, and also, like, if you're so close, like we are here, to get a lot of efficiency, if, if you this hits were to something, bump it, yeah. yeah. If you were to bump it with a sample or something like that, it would just pop off. Okay. Yeah. 
Now, I notice that we also have an optics position here. Mm -hmm. So uh, what kind of optics could we put here? Um, this optic position right now is set to be uh, a slip box, so you can change the shape of it. Um, like all of our snap lock optics, there's a little tab in the back, so okay. you can simply just lift it up, pull the whole optic forward. Uh, let me see what else I have. Uh, okay, so we've got a, looks like a, we've got a monochromator. So just like we talked about in that other system, right? So this is going to allow you to um, clean that beam up a little bit further. So this one is K-alpha K 1 and 2. This would filter it down to K-alpha 1 only. Um, optic goes in, you just lock it back down, and, you know, easy enough. Yeah. One thing I like about the monochromators, too, is we have the, the standard type of two bounce. Straight, That'll give you the two by two beam mm -hmm. coming out. Or we have what's called a compressing monochromator. Right, 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 yeah. Yep. And that'll actually take the beam and also compress it to one by two millimeter. Right. And that gives you really high intensity. And that's important for things like oxide epitaxial thin films, where intensity is key. Yeah, I mean, and, you know, we talk about matching the right tool to the right job. And yeah. particularly for a lot of the smaller samples, you may only have, say, like a one millimeter square. And so by compressing this down to a much uh, same intensity but a much smaller size, yeah. you're able to match that beam intensity and size to the size of your, your sample. You're not wasting yeah. x-rays by shooting them sideways off your sample. And then I think we have one other optic there that I actually kind of like. Um, so we call this one uh, a focusing global mirror, inverted global mirror. Oh, yeah, yeah. And the reason I like this one is you can actually take that two millimeter by two millimeter beam and convert it to a converging beam. So it'll actually converge on the sample. Mm -hmm. For applications like uh, grazing instance diffraction or in-plane grazing instance diffraction, this gives you significant intensity increase. Right. So I think what I'm hearing here is it's a lot of that right tool, right job. Yeah, right? and I think that that's one of the things that I've, I've really enjoyed about these particular um, setups is the customization that you, yeah. you have um, in terms of you know, we're seeing more and more that people are looking at doing sort of these multi-user, multidisciplinary environments, and it's easy enough to just swap out an optic or swap out a collimator, swap out a stage, um, in order to really get the right setup for a specific type of sample. Yeah. So it sounds like sealed tube. We're looking at if you need to change wavelengths, that's probably going to be the case. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If you want to have, if you're looking at large homogeneous powders or samples, that's right. going to be what you're looking for. Right. For this one, on the other hand, maybe if copper is good for you or one radiation is good for you, if uh, you're dialed in, yeah, you're looking at maybe the smaller bit in homogeneous samples, millimeter in size versus centimeter in size, or mm -hmm. I should say areas of interest, right? Millimeters so in size. So micro diffraction type applications. If you're looking at like one one grain in a rock or like one yep. little fleck of something, um, this is nice because you really can can spatially constrain your beam to something of interest. Yeah. Or yeah. if you want a system that has maybe less upkeep, no water cooling, things like that, this would be the one for you. Yeah. Yep. But then absolute power, that's going to be that rotating the anode. The rotating anode, yeah, yep. for max yep. power. So uh, what we're going to do now is head back over to the studio and answer some of the questions that have come in. All right, so here we are back in the studio. Uh, if there's any questions that you have, which we don't get to during the broadcast or you think of later, uh, email them to live.events at brooker.com and we will uh, make sure to get back to you on those. Uh, also, if you like this type of show, uh, please make sure to like, subscribe, and share with all your friends and we'll keep making more of these. Love to hear your feedback. So, we've got a few questions that have come in. One is from Bob. And that says, how can you get more intensity from a microfocus tube with no cooling water? Okay. That's, well, I think yeah, I've had people come up to me and yeah, go, yeah. come on, this doesn't make any sense. 1. Come 6 on. kilowatts yeah. versus 50. Yeah. Well, I mean, again, it, it's, it, it comes down to efficiency. You know, and I, it's, it's, I've dropped that word a lot. But if you think about like a laser pointer, like a laser pointer is going to be brighter um, than just like a regular light bulb. Yeah. But what you're hitting is going to be much smaller. So if you're trying to point out one spot on a, uh, you know, on the blackboard or something like that, and you have a laser pointer, that one spot is really, really lit up, and everything else around it is meh, right? Yeah. And so the, the, the thing about intensity that you're thinking about is it's not, it's not 
raw power all the time. That's not always the right answer. And I think that that's one of the things that you know we've, we've kind of like touched on a couple of times is making sure that if you do have a lot of intensity, um, but you're throwing it away because your sample is this big and you're just sort of bathing the whole thing, you're not really getting that much because like most of your, your x-rays are just going, just whiffing past it, right? So, yeah, yeah. I mean, the, the way I like to think about it too, it's it's all about efficiency. We keep saying that when it comes to the microfocus. Uh, with diffraction, if your photons aren't contributing to signal, they're going to background. Right. And so when you have either a spatially small area that you're interested in, mm -hmm. or you just need a very precise diffracting condition. So if you're looking at a single crystal where the beam is very straight in both directions, mm -hmm. then that is going to benefit uh, from that microfocus. Right. So, in fact, I think you have a few examples here. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Of samples. Um, so, let's see. We've got, uh, let's see. Uh, so, this is called a septarian nodule. So, it's a nice little, nice little geology sample. Um, so, these are uh, different areas. So, each area, so the little white spots, little black spots. So, these are, um, I think, a lot of carbonate minerals in mm -hmm. it. And based on what area you would hit, um, you could spatially resolve one region versus another. Whereas if you had sort of that traditional Bragg-Ventano thing, you would just sort of like bathe the whole setup, uh, you know, bathe the whole sample. Yeah, yeah. So you or would grind get, it. Or you could grind it, right? <laughs> I mean, you could turn it into a powder. I mean, I've, I've looked at things like this before yeah. in, in yeah. a traditional diverging beam geometry, but you get an average. Yeah. You get an average yeah. of the whole surface area, which may be useful information, but if you want to look at only one spot, either you would need to like chip off some of that or you can use that whole like spot beam micro focus thing and then just really sort of only point at one region. Yeah, I mean, yeah. one thing that I even um, would want to point out is that a sample like this, it might be interesting not just to look at the white area, the black area, the brown area, but it might be interesting to do like a scan where you hit different areas going like across a mapping it. Thing. Yeah, yeah, and actually be able to see the transition zones. And that tells you the story about how this was formed, right? Yeah. Yeah. Now this is likely it contains a very large grains or crystals, right? It can. I mean, this particular mm -hmm. one. So a lot of the carbonates tend to be very, very fine grained. But if you did have any sort of large grains, um, you could get sort of like almost like a single crystal diffraction pattern, which is sometimes a little bit trickier to deal with. Um, so one of the things that we we saw on that on that system was um, uh, stages that have a lot of different mo motions. Yeah, yeah. So you could use um, sort of a rocking thing. You could spin a sample. You could sort of wobble it back and forth. Yep. And this can help you sort of average out some of those um, those large grains. Yeah, in fact, there, there used to be uh, instruments where you would, instead of creating a powder, what you did is you took a single crystal, you placed it in the center of the instrument, and then you would spin it at very oh, high Gandalfi speeds. Type. Yeah, and they yeah, called that a Gandolfi yeah. camera. You spin it this way, but you also spin it this way. Yeah. And you're basically randomizing the crystal yeah. or the diffraction of the crystal. And we do that. We call that pseudo Gandolfi because we're not going so fast, but we'll actually spin it very quickly and tilt it. Yeah, and you're because, basically creating a powder from something that isn't a powder. Right, and that does require like yeah. a spot though. You have to hit a small spot with high intensity. That's why something like a microfocus works really well for that. Yeah, yeah. So the next question, uh, that's from John. Can you use the micro microsource on powders? <laughs> it's a good name, right? It's a dangerous it's a good, question yeah. for you, Nate. Can Nate you loves use his. the microsource for powders? <laughs> uh, yeah, and I think that you know the thing to think about is what is, right? We say powder diffraction, but what we really mean is polycrystalline diffraction, right? Yep. So anything that isn't single crystal or epitaxial. And for a very small amount of powder, um, we've actually done a couple of things where we were looking at, um, say, counterfeiting, or if you're looking at, say, like ink, or um, say, forensics type stuff. Like you've got like a small amount of powder that's on the side of, you know, um, you know the side of a rock, or, you know, some paint got scraped off of a car, you know, during like a, yep. a getaway. Yep. And you're really just trying to like, point at that. And yeah, I mean, uh, you know, the nice thing about the micro diffraction is, you know, like you said, if you're not hitting your sample, you're hitting, you know, you're getting background. But what if that background also diffracts, right? Yep. You know, yep. um, you know, if you're looking at, say, a piece of paper that's got, you know, some, you know, some, some gunpowder or something on it, and then you're, you know, you're bathing the whole sheet of paper, you're getting a lot of signal from that cellulose, you're getting a yeah. lot of signal yeah. from, you know, the, the white pigment in the paper. But if you can really focus that beam onto, you know, whatever region of interest you're looking at, um, you you increase the ratio of signal to background. Yeah, and one other thing I'd, I'd like to point out is that the microfocus, we, we talked about the beam size, two millimeter by two millimeter. Mm -hmm. And we often think about, well, let's collimate that using a small spot, making yeah. it a spot. Yeah. 
One thing we do around here though a lot is we'll actually put a line slip in. And that creates a beam that's yep. say, instead of being point, uh, like two millimeter down to point two round, it's actually two millimeters long mm -hmm. by point two wide. Yeah. So that preserves a lot of intensity. It gives you basically a mini line beam, yeah. two millimeters in length. And you're in, you can still get just diffraction patterns of a few minutes. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, we talked about like the, uh, you know, the multifunctional, multi-user type environment. Yeah. And I think that um, for systems like that, um, it's really nice because you, it's, it's about beam shaping to match what you have. So if you have um, you know, a very small piece of substrate, like a functional oxide, you, know, you, can, you can match that. If you've got um, you know, a traditional powder type application, say mineralogy or something like that, uh, you know, again, you know, you're going to have a bigger sample holder with more samples, so you, know, you, you use more of the beam. You get more, yep. more intensity out of it. So a lot of micro-focus questions. Uh, the next one from Alan. Uh, what's the smallest sample you can get data from using a microsource? How much time do you have? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, I mean, yeah, and, and it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a bit of a, of a loaded question, right? Because um, the amount of, you know, the smaller your beam is, uh, the less volume of diffraction that you have. You have fewer atoms, fewer electrons contributing yeah. to that diffraction process. So um, we've seen people with truncating beams down to say 50 microns, 50 or 100 yeah. microns, um, but you may only be hitting one or two grains. So that's that's a very yeah. long counting time, but it's it's definitely possible. It's also a question of do you have to isolate the sample from the background? There's no right. problem with bathing a sample with a beam that's slightly yeah. larger. Um, but yeah, I would say the comfortable area, you know, 50 microns, 20 microns uh, isolation wise. Otherwise, yeah, you can go much smaller as long as it gives you the signal that you need, yeah. right? Signal yeah. over the background. So uh, we've run out of time. If we haven't gotten your question again, send it to uh, that email address, uh, live.events at brooker.com. Uh, so until next time, keep your signal high and your background low. Thanks for coming, guys. Mm -hmm.